Um, thank you everyone for joining and taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for today's presentation. Uh, before I get started, I do want to thank Ben and the entire team at TechSoup Canada for um, the opportunity to, to partner with them and provide this, uh, this presentation today. So as Ben mentioned, we've got roughly about 45 minutes where I'm going to go through uh, various slides and various aspects of cybersecurity and privacy. Um, but you know the focus is going to be really on your questions. So to the extent you have any any issues or questions that come to mind, feel free to chime in. Send those questions through that chat box that Ben had mentioned. Be happy to take those and and provide you as much detail as possible that would be helpful for your organization. So Ben already was very kind with his uh, with his introduction. The one thing I will mention, which I'm very very excited about, starting in May, I will be uh, an adjunct professor at the University of Toronto, uh, teaching cybersecurity law. It's something uh, I think it's important um, and a topic, quite frankly, that a lot of universities and higher education uh, institutions are now building in the curriculum, recognizing that this is the new norm. So. You have in front of you the, the very high level agenda of what we're going to be covering on, during today's presentation. But before maybe I got started, I wanted to tell you how this has emerged as an area, at least from my practice perspective. Um, I take you back about eight or nine years ago. I, I've been practicing law as a regulatory lawyer for many years. Uh, I'd practiced in the area of privacy in particular. And what we had seen uh, in the early days was an uptick in terms of what we call cyber incidents or cyber breaches, which I'll get into a bit later. And so I went to our managing partner at the time and said, look, you know what, cybersecurity is much bigger than just privacy law. We really should expand this a bit more because the clients are going to be looking at litigation exposure, they may be looking at insurance, there may be some technology issues related to suppliers. It's much more of a holistic approach. And, and at the time, uh, the, the idea was relatively novel, if you can believe that. We, we launched the group about eight or nine years ago, and then afterwards, uh, in relatively short succession, you had three major cybersecurity incidents, which really changed the, the landscape when it comes to uh, cybersecurity in Canada and just internationally as a general proposition. The first one was uh, Sony, which was state-sponsored. The second one was Target. And the third one was Home Depot. And what those three breaches did were they were able to demonstrate that third parties could get access to your data, steal it from your network, and then use it to either profit themselves or to put it online and embarrass the organization. The other piece that also came out of that, that they can disrupt operations of an organization in a real meaningful way for a real prolonged period of time. And that's where, you know, it was interesting around the same time, we do these annual surveys of our clients asking them, you know, compliance managers or, or executive directors or general counsels within an organization, you know, for the upcoming year, what are some of the key legal issues that you're going to be concerned about or, or looking at? And what they typically would come back to us would be labor and employment issues, for example, or we're going to be doing a deal. So M&A is, is a concern. Cybersecurity and privacy about eight or nine years ago was not on the radar. But very shortly after those three major breaches, Sony, Home Depot, and Target, you've seen cybersecurity and privacy in particular uh, being amongst the top three concerns for organizations. And the reason for that is, and I'll show you this a bit later in, in our presentation, is the fallout from a significant cyber incident, one which is public, can be very significant on an organization from a reputational standpoint, uh, from a financial standpoint, and obviously from an operational standpoint. Uh, there's also legal exposure that comes along with it. But on the reputational piece, probably the most important piece for, for not-for-profits is because a lot of the individuals who are going to be donating to organizations is based on a relationship of trust trust that they will be obviously using the funds and the donations in, in the way that they're, they're, they're seeking to have it applied. But more importantly, uh, that there's a trust that the information about the donor that's provided, credit card information, name, address, whatever other information you may require from your donors, is going to be well protected. Same thing on the grant front from various organizations which are funding charitable initiatives. So that's why cybersecurity has really gone onto the radar and since uh, the past three or four years has been consistently amongst the top three issues that, uh, that senior executives have been thinking about. So the question is, uh, what is cybersecurity? Uh, I gave you a bit of an overview, uh, but essentially it's anything that's related to your data protection. 
Uh, if you have data and you're storing it, and the data can be different aspects uh, that we'll get into in just a minute, it could be financial, could be health, could be other, the data is in your network and how is it protected? So when we talk about a cyber incident or a cyber security breach, what that means is you had a state of data protected, but it got breached somehow, it was compromised. And, and that's really where cybersecurity kicks in. And it's, it's also much broader than the traditional view a lot of people have, which is, if you were to ask my mother, her view would be of uh, somebody, a young teenager with a hoodie on in, front, in a dark room in the basement with a lot of screen numbers on, trying to break into a network. And certainly that is a portion of, of the folks who are actually committing a lot of these, these acts. But there's also a significant number of cyber incidents that go well beyond that. For example, employees or staff or volunteers snooping in accounts because of a high-profile client or customer or donor. Um, for example, you know, wire transfer fraud, which occurs because people are able to take over an account or pretend to be a CFO and say that we need to pay certain amounts to a vendor uh, urgently in a fake account that doesn't really exist. So there are variations of what cyber is and what cyber threats are facing an organization. I'll get into that in just a minute. So one of the questions we often ask our clients when we go in and, and chat with them about cybersecurity is, you know, what kind of information do you have? And the first comment we get back is typically, you know, we don't have that much information. Nobody would be interested in the information we have in any event, or we don't store it on the premises, so why would somebody even try to target us? What's interesting is when you drill down and you really look at the quantity and the type of data they have, they realize very quickly they have much more than they thought they did. And so, obviously, the most, the most common one that people think about is customer information. This could also be donor information in the case of not-for-profits. Um, and in that category, financial and health information is considered to be something which is particularly sensitive. I'll explain why. When, when I gave you the example of Home Depot or Target, where, for example, these massive breaches occurred, the big question that came up was, what information was actually stolen? It really was credit card information. And credit card information is essentially made up of two bits of information. The first one is the magnetic swipe on the card, and the second one is the text on the card, so your name or expiration date on the card. If you put both of those together, you can then go and complete a transaction, for example, or, or copy a card. Um, but typically what happens is when those kind of incidents occur in terms of a breach, uh, long story short, the shelf life is relatively limited. Once the, the breach has been discovered, companies will typically cancel the card and issue new ones or have them issue new ones. And, and, and the issue typically gets resolved that way with some credit monitoring. The problem with financial and health information is, first of all, it's very personal. And it's not something which can, it has a very long shelf life. It's not something that can be simply replaced very quickly. So the repair or the remediation of an identity fraud is very, very difficult. So if somebody can get, for example, my Imran Ahmad's uh, date of birth, address, social insurance number, maybe some of my health records, and maybe some information about where I lived in the past as well, that universe of information will be very valuable because with that, they can create a virtual profile on me. And that virtual profile can then be used to commit identity fraud and other types of crimes. For me then to go and fix that for my credit score or for whatever other reason will be extremely difficult. So those two categories, given that you know, typically the financial information in particular uh, coming from donors is one which is very present in the not-for-profit space is something organizations should be very cognizant about. The other two categories I'll go through relatively quickly, um, that organizations typically have also confidential information. I gave you a couple of examples here. It could be intellectual property, it could be internal investigation. So think of, for example, large mining or oil companies which are operating around the world, but it may have an office here in Canada. Um, they may be running investigations on environmental record impacts or so on. Um, so that information is viewed typically as being very confidential. Business plans with business and financial forecasts those are also uh, very important. Anti-money laundering investigations and so on are also very important. So those types of information, if it got out into the public sphere, would be also a real concern. The last one I do want to highlight a little bit is supplier or purchaser's confidential information or proprietary information. And this one is really key, uh, and it often goes under the radar. 
more often than not, any organization, maybe in the charitable space or maybe a public organization or even a private company, they will be using vendors. They'll be using them for cloud services. They may be using them for an application they want installed um, or a variety of other things. It, to the extent those third parties are going to be processing or getting access to any of that confidential or personal information of either your donors or stakeholders, that's going to become a real concern if it ever got compromised. So we've had situations where you know email accounts of executives was compromised, uh, key contracts with a lot of confidential information on pricing uh, and so on was leaked out and caused prejudice. And under the agreement, they, the company that got compromised had to compensate uh, uh, and was liable for the losses that were incurred from their partner. So that's an area where we are seeing more and more of that coming up in contracts, especially when they're being negotiated with third parties. I won't spend too much time on this because I've, I've actually given you a bit of an overview, but I like the diagram here for a couple of reasons. You know, I gave you an example, for example, uh, of my name, address, social insurance number. Those are the easy things we can typically pick up. But you also now, because a lot of organizations are picking up detailed information about behavior, perhaps on ethnicity, on choices and preferences that individuals have when they select either uh, a product, a brand, or what have you. You know, those are information and data that's being collected and stored within organizations. Um, and you'd be surprised as to how granular and how specific it can get. So, for example, on this chart, you have um, uh, ethnicity. That's now more often than not a very common question that is asked in uh, profile uh, identification for, for, for very good reasons and legitimate reasons, but it is identifiable to an individual. And if that information got leaked, there is ways to getting and rebuilding that profile on an individual at a much more granular level, hence the, vo the, the value of protecting that information being very significant. Um, so this chart gives you five broad categories, internal information, historical information, that's really valuable as well because if you can talk about trends, you can validate credentials with you know, telecom companies or, or, or cable service providers and so on. Um, Social is also very important in terms of preferences, you know, uh, in terms of religious organizations, you have an example there in terms of public life, family, social network, and so on and the external piece, which is really uh, on the behavioral side of things and demographics. So they just wanted you to have this table or this chart here because it's a good visual depiction of the types of information that individuals typically share with organizations these days. So coming back to types of common threats. You know, the, the, the most classic one is somebody breaking into your network, uh, stealing data, and either you know installing malware or doing something of that nature. But I want to flag a couple of others which are on this one, um, the slide that I have in front of you, which is actually quite relevant as well. One is a denial of service attack. Uh, what this is in the most simplest of terms is a hacker is able to break into other computers, so this could be, let's say, a smart uh, stove or a smart fridge, which doesn't have a lot of security built into it. They can get into it, and because it's connected to the internet, they can direct what we call junk traffic to a specific website. And when you send a lot of traffic to a site, you can basically bring the website down. Websites are designed in a way where they can absorb and maintain a certain volume of traffic. Anything above that typically will have the website crash. Now that may seem like a very minor issue, but in the in the not-for-profit space, it's a big concern because many websites are now transactional, where people can make online donations uh, or provide information or complete some form of a transaction online. So each hour or each day that the website is down, those are dollars that are lost by the organization. We we had advised a client uh, just recently, they were in the midst of a, a large campaign. And what these hackers were able to do was do exactly as I described. They were able to direct junk traffic, bring the website down. And not only did they bring the website down, they then turned to the organization and said, we, if you pay us X bitcoins, we will make your site come back online. We'll stop sending this junk traffic so you can go on with your campaign. Um, and the amount that they were asking in Bitcoin was sufficiently low, but still significant, uh, that you know the company was seriously considering making that payment. So that's an example of where a DDoS attack uh, can be a real concern. 
The other one you see here is the fourth one or, or the second, or the first one on the second row, corporate impersonation and phishing. This is extremely common now, uh, especially in, in mid-size or smaller organizations. This is where things can actually go sideways very quickly. You'll basically have a, a hacker uh, stalk or social stalk an individual. So they'll go after company ABC, try to figure out by going to LinkedIn and Facebook and, and Twitter who their CFO is, what his or her name is, you know, what are their standard hours of operation, that kind of stuff. So they'll basically build a real profile around that individual. They'll then typically either do one of two things, create an email account which is sufficiently close to the company or the organization's email address, so they may switch one letter or, or one character in there, or they'll be able to take over the account of the individual and then send an email from that email address saying, I'm the CFO or I'm the CEO or the executive director of the organization, I'm sending you, the accounting person, this information that I've been told that a vendor has not been paid for over 180 days, for example, and we need to make the payment on, on an expedited basis. Can you please transfer these funds to an account in Singapore, Hong Kong, it could even be in the United States at a, at a bank that is international. And if these small and medium-sized organizations are not diligent, they typically, for good reason, don't have formal policies or protocols in terms of verifying such a request, either in writing or, or by phone or otherwise, then at that point, they may transfer those funds. And once those funds are gone, the, the window of opportunity to stop and get those funds back is a question of, of minutes and, in some cases, at most, a couple of hours. And once those funds are gone, they're really gone. So that's something we've seen an uptick in. And just so you know, uh, most insurance policies under the general liability piece will not cover those types of losses. You have to have a very specific crime type policy because the transfer is being done willfully. There's no theft of data. You, you certainly have somebody duping um, an account executive or an accounting individual, but you don't have the actual theft of data. You have a willful, incorrect, mind you, transfer of, that, of those funds. So you've got a couple of other examples here. I won't spend any time on that. Uh, the next slide that I want to share with you is, a, is an example of, um, of, of the type of email that I was just describing for transfers. Um, it, this is a good example, which, which we uh, found online, uh, gives you a sense of the type of emails that the person could send. You know, on the face of it, it doesn't look any different than anything else. And if you had the, the redacted sections available, you would see that the emails from which it was being sent was very close to the actual corporate or the organization's email domain. So it would have been very difficult unless somebody was really being diligent um, to have noticed that this was coming from an external actor. So just wanna share some statistics with you. Um, the numbers are less relevant here uh, than the fact that the main thread here is that these attacks and the losses related to these type of attacks are going to increase consistently over the next few years. Every single year for the past 10 years, the losses coming from cyber crime, and I use that term very broadly, um, has increased year over year with a huge uptick over the past three years. And what we've seen over the next little while, or at least what the projection forecasts look like, is that that's going to continue to increase. One thing I want to flag to you all is, is one specific type of attack, which is very low cost for a hacker, but has devastating effect on a company or an organization, and that is one of ransomware. Very easy to do. So if you're a hacker, you go onto the dark net, which is basically an underground internet space, if you wish. It's, it's uh, not really monitored. It's not like you put in a URL, uh, as you would for, for searching a regular website on the internet. There's a particular way of getting access to it. And on this black market, um, various criminals will sell you what we call kits related to ransomware. So they sell you a software, uh, which is basically something you would include into an email that you basically send out to a series of individuals. It could be across an industry, it could be across a geography, it could be a variety of things. So the hacker will send out, will buy this, this toolkit, which has the malware, which is ransomware, They'll spray and send hundreds, if not thousands, of emails out to multiple recipients across, let's say in this case, Canada. Uh, 
And they'll, they'll basically, if somebody clicks, they'll wait for somebody to click on that link or on that attachment. And if the person clicks on that malware attachment or link, it will basically lock down their computer. So these are the examples you've heard about or seen on TV where basically the computer is no longer accessible by the user and there's a little clock with a, with a timeline on it that you, know, you either call this number or email this address and you've got X number of hours to comply, otherwise we're going to delete your data or you won't get access to your computer back. And so what we've seen over the past year and a half is an increase in those attacks because the cost of buying these kits, unfortunately, is very low. It's a couple hundred dollars. The amount, the ransom that these hackers are typically asking for ranges between a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand dollars. So even if they send out a thousand emails, but only five or six people click on it, the return they get versus the investment they made in buying that malware toolkit is significant. And so just doing a simple cost benefit analysis, it makes a lot of sense for them to invest, quote unquote, in this type of, of malware. And what we have seen is a huge increase over the last little while in, um, in that area. The good news, if you want to look at it from that perspective, is that uh, a lot of the insurers are now offering uh, what we call cyber extortion coverage, uh, part of a cyber policy. So if you do have insurance, you may want to double check with your broker and your carrier whether you have that type of protection because um, that can be quite expensive in some cases in terms of just paying the amount and then making sure your systems are back online. So. This this uh, slide, I just want to spend a couple of minutes, but these are just Canadian examples of what's occurred over the past year or so. And each one is different. You know, the first one is basically your classic credit card theft uh, example that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the second one related to Bell was the theft of email addresses. Uh, and, and, you know, nobody really knows the details around what beyond the email addresses were compromised. Um, but the third one is something I just want to spend maybe a second on. Um, it was significant. So Casino Rama had a data breach. All kinds of information was compromised and stolen from their network. But where the class action that ensued really focused on was the fact that Casino Rama kept data and personal information about its patrons longer than it should have. So as most of you may be aware, under Canadian privacy legislation, when you collect information from an individual, maybe a donor or anybody else, you're only supposed to keep that information, A, for a very specific purpose. You're supposed to collect it with, for a specific purpose. And you only keep it as long as that purpose is requiring it to be kept. So if you're collecting credit card information to be able to complete a transaction, fine. You may want to keep it for a little while longer after the transaction is complete in case you need to reverse the transaction that's fine too um, but you're not allowed to keep that information in perpetuity and this is where Casino Rama got in trouble because they were keeping a lot of information for an extended period of time with no good reason or justification for it and so the breach itself notwithstanding what that exposed them to also raised all kinds of other issues and that's really the key takeaway from that case so in terms of who's actually doing this and why would they want to do this, I think this chart, which uh, PwC had put together a little while ago, is a really good summary. And I don't propose to go through in, in any great detail, but I'd say organized crime, which is the second category here, is probably 80 to 90 percent of the type of incidents that we see. It's a business for these people. They want to make sure that they make a lot of money in a very short period of time. And so they will be very targeted in terms of those either you know, the malware, ransomware attack that I mentioned or otherwise. Um, the hacktivists are rare. They will be doing this for a specific reason to make a point. They're not asking for money or compensation, but they're looking at this. But the bigger one also uh, after organized crime is the insider threat. And I say bigger one because it, it's extremely difficult to identify who may be disgruntled and who may be uh, an employee, a staff, or a volunteer who may have reason to, to be the weakest link, if you wish, intentionally to, to hurt the organization. And so one of the recommendations we do is certainly, you know, the background checks and the, and the, the reference checks are, are good uh, processes, but they only get you up to a certain point. The other piece is, you know, really engage with your HR department or HR professional within the company or the organization for the following reason, because they have their ear to the ground. They will know 
who got passed over for promotion, who may have a different view about the direction of the organization, who may be a disgruntled as a, as a general proposition, who may have essentially a motive to be able to engage in, in a, some kind of a cyber activity. Um, so I just mentioned that because that is something we are starting to see more and more of. So shifting gears. We've talked about what the breaches may look like, you know, where they may be coming from, who the actors are, what their motivations are. Let's talk about what can the impact be. And this is really based on what we have seen in the industry uh, across various uh, geographies, across various segments of industries. It could be retail, it could be charitable organizations and others. Um, what can the impact be on an organization if something was to ever occur? Um, in this one, what you'll see is, and I've sort of put in bold sort of the key ones that are that are really important here. Um, legal liability and regulatory enforcement is probably the biggest one, followed very very closely with, with reputational harm and business interruption. There was a very interesting survey that was done about a year or so ago by a PR firm, which basically canvassed two groups of people within the same organization. So the first group were were business executives. Uh, these are individuals who are you know, directing the organization, senior leadership, if you wish, executive directors, and so on. Uh, and the other group were more on what I would call on the operational side. So these are the technical people who are running the organization, uh, IT department, and so on. And the question was asked, you know, if, if a breach was to occur, what would be your number one concern or priority? And what, what came out of that was, although they, the, some of the issues overlapped, they were somewhat different. The senior leadership team, if you wish, or the business people, uh, were much more focused on the legal liability, the regulatory enforcement, reputational harm, um, and to a certain extent, business interruption. That was the real focus for these individuals. However, the IT folks were really just getting the business up and running and to make sure nobody got hurt. And all of those purposes or, or focus areas are appropriate. But in a crisis scenario, when an organization is being attacked, you can never focus on five different fronts at a given time. You really need to pick and choose what the key areas are going to be. Um, and so that's where you often have people pulling in the wrong direction or in directions that are not exactly fully aligned. And that's where, you know, having a tabletop exercise, and I'll get into best practices in just a minute, um, is going to be a key factor. So just a couple of words in terms of where Canada is headed and what the landscape looks like. Um, I take you back to October of 2015. We had a, a new government that was elected. Um, the prime minister at that point indicated that he wanted to be as transparent as possible. And for the first time in Kane history was, was making public what we call ministerial mandate letters. These are letters which are sent to various ministers uh, asking them to uh, do specific things during their mandate. And our Minister of Public Safety received the mandate to look at critical infrastructure and what kind of cyber threats they may be facing. That mandate was expanded very, very quickly uh, to include protecting Canadian citizens and, uh, and generally the Canadian economy as well. And what happened after that was a consultation process where the, the minister went out and um, and consulted with uh, various stakeholders in terms of what their key considerations were. And that has resulted in um, a, a position paper and additional funding that's going to be coming out very shortly. So that being said, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the legal structure or the legal landscape in Canada, the US, and, uh, and in Europe. And I mentioned those three uh, for the following reason. Data is now international. And for, for many charitable and not-for-profit organizations, um, the data comes, or the donor's money, for example, comes from multiple jurisdictions. So you can easily have a Canadian who may or may not have dual citizenship in Europe who is making contribution through a website. At that point, you are not exclusively limited to Canadian privacy or, or cyber legislation, but it would be also European requirements that go along with it. So organizations in Canada who are operating in that space need to be mindful of what those requirements are globally because the data itself is very global and the manner in which it's obtained is very global. So in Canada, uh, I'll just flip to a slide and then come back to this. In Canada, as you can imagine, it's a bit of a patchwork of legislation depending where you may be located. If I had to broadly give you a sense of, of how it works, um, you've got our federal privacy legislation for the 
public sector. So this is for the government, employees, crown corporations, and so on. You've got our federal privacy legislation for the private sector, uh, which is PIPEDA. It applies across the country, except in three provinces where those provinces have their own private sector privacy laws, and those are British Columbia, Alberta, and Quebec. In addition to that, each province has its own public sector law, and then each province also typically has, or territory also has, its own health privacy legislation, which has very specific requirements in it. So navigating through these different types of privacy legislation, data protection laws, can be a bit of a challenge when you are collecting uh, information from across the country and that a breach occurs to be able to have a very clear understanding which data was, was compromised, how it was compromised, and what your requirements are in terms of notifications and dealing with various regulators across the country can be sometimes very complex. So coming back here on this slide, um, that's PIPEDA. I, it summarizes exactly what I had explained earlier. You also have our criminal code. Um, it's, it's not the best in terms of what you have available in terms of cyber, but there are two main provisions in there which are relevant. The first one is related to uh, unauthorized access to your network. And the second one is creating mischief within somebody else's network. Um, they're very seldomly used, and the reason for that is once a breach occurs, rare are going to be the instances where law enforcement's running the investigation for you and that they have the resources to do that. I'll get into that in just a minute as well. But typically, if you are able to identify the individual for whatever reason through your own investigation or forensics, at that point, you may have an option uh, to use a criminal code it's really relevant if the individual is in Canada, if they're outside of Canada, it's nine times out of 10 not worth the effort or the time or the cost to, uh, to bring them before the courts. And then Quebec as well, which is my, my home province, although I live in Toronto now, uh, which has its own civil code and, and legal framework when it comes to, uh, to privacy and, and technology related law. So I want to talk a little bit about the Digital Privacy Act because this is something a bit of a game changer and very topical because of what's happened in the past week or so. So I take you back to June of 2015. June of 2015, the previous government had adopted what we call the Digital Privacy Act. And Digital Privacy Act amended PIPEDA, which is the federal private sector legislation in, in several significant ways. Most of the changes came into force right away. But there were three significant changes that were basically delayed. The first one was to have what we call mandatory breach notification come into Canada. The second one was to keep a record of any kind of security safeguard breach. And I'll, I'll get into what that means in just a minute. And fines of up to $100,000 uh, if you fail to either report that mandatory breach that was required or to keep those records that were required as well. Putting this in broader context, there's a reason why these changes were made. In the United States, for example, you've got 48 states that have what we call mandatory breach notification. So if you are uh, a company in the U.S. and you have a breach, not only do you notify the regulator, and more often than not, it's the Attorney General's uh, website or, or office, uh, but you also have to notify the individuals that their information was compromised, that you have taken steps to uh, mitigate the damage or the harm to them, more often than not, offering credit monitoring as well. In Canada, until now, that wasn't the case. You typically would go to the regulator. Uh, in some exceptional situations, you may notify the individuals, but going to the individuals who were affected by the breach was not an automatic thing that happened. Um, that's now going to be changing. To bring Canada much more in line with the European and the US regimes, what we've done now is not only do you go to the regulator, which is the Office of the Privacy Commissioner, to let him know that a breach has occurred, but you also, if there is a significant risk of harm to the individual whose information was compromised, and that's a term used in the legislation, um, to actually let them know that the breach has occurred. So you have to communicate with them directly at the same time as you're communicating, for example, with the regulator. So there's a self-assessment that needs to be made. And how do you determine significant harm will be a case-by-case -case analysis. So certainly losing financial information like somebody's SIN number and credit card information would likely qualify as a significant harm to an individual. Reputational harm, which is a bit more difficult to, to determine, would also fall in a category of significant harm. And so that's going to be a big piece of the new landscape that's going to be kicking in. Um, so why do I say it's going to be changing? Well, the, the update is this. So 2015, that happens. 
previous government, elections ensue, new government gets elected. The regulations that would have made these requirements mandatory were delayed, actually delayed significantly. And then in, in October of last year, of 2017, the government came out with their um, draft regulations to make this a reality. And those regulations uh, basically uh, receive comments from the public, receive comments from practitioners like lawyers and others and other stakeholders, and then uh, were basically taken back uh, by the government and, and to be reworked into the final version that was going to be released. About a week and a half ago, the government announced that starting November 1st, 2018, so this year, um, a mandatory breach and all of these changes that I've discussed including keeping a record of every breach that occurs within an organization will come into force. So organizations now have, we're in April, roughly about six to seven months uh, to be compliant with those requirements. And just yesterday, the final version of those regulations were also released. So the timing of today's presentation is great, and I was chatting with, uh, with the folks at TechSoup a bit earlier about this. Uh, the issue of mandatory breach and keeping a record is, is something that folks should be very mindful of. A lot of these changes are also coming because our European cousins are implementing what we call the Global Data Protection Regulation. And most of our clients have said, why should we care about a European regulation? Well, there's a good reason for that. First of all, it's one of the very few regulation or laws out there which has what we call extraterritorial scope. It's well established in, in law as a general proposition that if you are, let's say, the government of Canada, you will adopt laws that apply to Canadian companies. Or, or Canadian citizens. Rare will be the instances where the Canadian government is ever going to pass legislation that would apply to, let's say, Peru, for example. Uh, you don't go beyond your own territory. What the Europeans have done is taken a slightly different approach. They've said it's not jurisdictional. Data is so ubiquitous that it can go anywhere. It can cross border very freely. And so to be able to protect the personal information of European data subjects, as they call them, or I would just leave them to European individuals, you know, we need to have some safeguards. So if you are, for example, a Canadian organization collecting information about a European data subject with no location, no brick and mortar uh, place of business in, in Europe, you may be caught, there are certain requirements, you may be caught by GDPR and you would have to comply with all the various requirements related to consent, to the right to be forgotten, how do you protect the data that you hold in your possession, what happens if a breach like a cyber attack ever occurred, who do you notify, and, and what timelines you have to notify within. So the European GDPR is going to be significant as well. It's actually kicking in next month on May 25th of 2018. So the changes that we're seeing in the legal landscape in Canada are partly driven by the fact our European partners are adopting very significant legislation and our American partners also are collecting uh, or and implementing a legal framework to protect that data for individuals. So I'm just going to uh, switch slides here and the next three slides I will literally pass only 30 seconds on them. It's only to give you a bit of a sense of some of the litigation exposure that's happening and an increase when it comes to litigation. Um, what we've seen is under various statutes of the privacy laws I mentioned a bit earlier, there's been an, uh, an increase in the number of cases being brought and awards that are being given in terms of those breaches. May it be specific incidents uh, related to individuals or may it be related to uh, class action initiatives that are based on statutory violations. But what we're also seeing is an increase in tort law uh, in this area, which is unique in the sense that tort law is historically something that changes very rarely or very with a lot of difficulty. Uh, once it's set, it's set typically. Uh, but what we've seen is a willingness by the courts to accept and look at new types of torts uh, when they come to the area of either privacy or cyber security. And there are just a couple of examples I've listed here. I do not propose to go through any of them in any great detail, but one example is this one, uh, Jane Doe. It's interesting because if you look at the fact scenario of Jane Doe, it's very unique. Uh, a couple had made a, a video which was romantic in nature, 
uh, the couple's relationship broke down. The video by one of the individuals of the couple uh, was released um, without the other individual's consent, causing significant harm to one of the couple members. And and the court obviously uh, compensated or, or awarded an amount uh, that was quite significant under those circumstances. So the case itself is is what it is. And the question people often ask is, you know, what does this have to do with cybersecurity? Well, what we have seen is a lot of new uh, mandate or cases being brought forward where people are arguing, hold on a second, if you look at the base of it, the fundamental of this case, it was the disclosure of information without somebody's consent or authorization. How is a breach where a company perhaps or an organization perhaps acted negligently and accidentally had the information released any different than this case uh, is, for example? Obviously, there are nuances and there are details, but what we're seeing is courts are much more willing to entertain at least some of those discussions by, uh, by the parties. And that's where we're seeing a growth in terms of novel and creative ways of bringing actions before the courts when it comes to the area of cybersecurity and privacy law. All right, I've only got a couple more slides and then hopefully we'll be able to, to switch our focus to some Q&A and, and answering questions that you guys have. Um, this, this graph or this, this picture I have on this slide is actually very helpful, I think, in many ways. Uh, about 10, 15 years ago, if somebody was to ask, you know, who is responsible for cybersecurity, folks would probably say it's the IT director. That mindset has completely changed. Under um, all kinds of cases that we've seen, especially with the Target case out of the US and some of the follow-on here in Canada, what we've seen is the courts want to see that senior management at the highest level are engaged, that they've made cyber and privacy a priority for the organization, recognizing the kind of data that they have in their possession. And they want to be able to tell some of the operational folks, so that's the second level, to be able to monitor and, and look at how cybersecurity is generally managed within the organization. All of that flowing to the front lines, uh, if you wish, in terms of, of workers and employees and volunteers who are engaged with the organization, but also looping it back up then so that there's real-time feedback coming all the way to the executive level as well. And that's really important because if you can get that feedback, then you can allocate more resources uh, to a cause and be aware of the, the risk exposure that the organization may be facing. And from a, a governance standpoint, that is really the key. The shift in law has been the following, where historically the board simply needed, or the senior management team simply needed to be aware of cyber risks. Now they need to be engaged in managing cyber risk. That's a, that's a huge difference. Because how do you demonstrate that you are engaged in managing the risk? Well, you need to know what the risk is. You have to ask the right questions. You need to know what your actual posture is vis-a-vis -vis that risk. And then you need to be able to take steps and measures. So these are proactive steps an organization and its leadership has to take to be able to demonstrate that they've done what they had to do. Failure to do that may show that the organization's leadership team was negligent in some respects. So I thought this table or this picture was, was very helpful in that regard. One of the exercises we undertook at, at Miller Thompson a little while ago was um, to take a look at all the case law we could find in Canada across all jurisdictions in terms of privacy, data, or cybersecurity uh, incidents that had occurred that had actually ended up in court. And look at what the courts were, were looking at. The good news, if you wish, when we, when we went through that exercise was the standard that the courts are looking for is not one of perfection. So it's not just because you hold data that you, know, you can never have a cyber breach. Rather, what the courts are looking for is to show that the organization acted as reasonably as possible under the circumstances. So what does that mean? There are a couple of things that have come up over and over again to demonstrate that the organization has acted reasonably. So the first one is, and it's, it may seem very intuitive, but it's actually not as, straight, as forward as you would think. So know where you stand. Um, that basically means you need to know what data you have, how you, you keep it, and where you keep it. And at first glance, that may seem very obvious. But when you factor in the fact there may be turnover within an organization, where you may be adding on new services or applications or software onto legacy systems, where you may have just built on top of precedent stuff, or that you know you may have a, a mix between maybe being in the cloud and maybe having physical servers and so on. 
um, or that the data that you collect has been over a period of 10, 15, 20 years or a longer period of time, it becomes very difficult if I was to ask you or ask those clients, they give me a flow chart exactly showing me where you keep credit card information. Show me exactly where the SIN fields are or the social insurance number fields are. Tell me if you're collecting behavioral data about your visitors on your website, what kind of cookies and so on that are collected or implemented when they visit your site. Show me how you're doing this. And, and nine times out of 10, they can do it. When you cannot demonstrate that you know where the data is, what kind of data you have and how it's kept, when a breach occurs, when a cyber attack happens, you're going to be scrambling and wasting quite a bit of time just trying to figure out the basics. So knowing where you stand, so there's an application whitelisting and a risk profile that you should be building that's listed here. Really, it's if you can summarize it in one chart, um, working with your IT or your vendors uh, to figure out where the data is, that will be a huge step in the right direction. Number two, build a cyber monitoring team. This may be a bit difficult for smaller organizations, but as a general rule, you should have at least three people on it, somebody from the business or, or the management side. Hopefully, if you have somebody from legal or somebody who's managing risk like CFO or somebody on the financial side of things, and if you have somebody from HR, they should be involved. And the purpose is they, they get together on a, on a semi-regular basis. It could be quarterly. It could be more frequent than that if you wish. And they're looking at how the organization is doing. So they're working with the IT director or the IT vendor who's monitoring your system. How are we doing? Are we being probed by third party? These are basically people trying to figure out what your network security looks like. Are we doing anything in terms of additional resources we need? Do we need to patch anything? Do we need to buy new patching software or, or any kind of firewalls or additional security uh, services that are required? And then they're going to be responsible for relaying any gaps or deficiencies back to the senior management team so that they can make those investments uh, if necessary and in a phased approach. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I'm going to skip down to educate uh, staff and the supply chain piece as well. So educate and train staff. I can't uh, overemphasize the importance of this one specific one, especially for not-for-profits and charitable organizations, which are reliant on not only stakeholders, but volunteers and staff who are taking time out of their busy schedules to give something back to the community and through this specific organization. More often than not, they haven't received what we call cyber hygiene training, you know, when not to click on something, when not to do something which may be harming the network. Sometimes organizations will give uh, volunteers and staff an email address that they can use to communicate internally. Um, those are things that staff training should be done on a semi-regular basis, should be part of the onboarding process. It doesn't have to be overly complicated. It doesn't have to be overly expensive either. There are good solutions out there from a technology standpoint, which are very, very affordable from a cost perspective uh, to be able to provide that kind of training to people who are entering the organization, but also to staff that are there so you can show that they have actually gone that type of level of, of education when it comes to cyber threats. The fourth one, supply chain risk, uh, which I want to focus on, is also very important. As I mentioned um, before, you know, rare are the organizations that are able to do everything from A to Z. Typically, you will rely on third-party vendors for all kinds of services. I gave the example of cloud services, or it could be a software, it could be something else. Um, to the extent that they are collecting and using your data, especially when that data relates to personal information or confidential information, you want to make sure your contracts are rock solid. And that's an area where we're particularly uh, busy is you want to build, and there's a suite of clauses you want to have in there. For example, breach notification. Let's say that vendor got compromised uh, and your, the data that you had passed along to them was either stolen or, or otherwise made public without authorization. Um, although it happened to them, technically because the organization collected the information before they passed it along, the organization would be on the hook. So the, the, the liability would rest with them. So you want to make sure you are informed almost instantly when the breach occurs at a vendor which would have affected your information. You want that vendor to be able to cooperate with you in an investigation. If you need to bring a consultant or an expert in to investigate what happened and to make sure that the systems are secure, you want that vendor to work with you, not just simply notify you. The clauses should also talk about, for example, what was the cost structure look like? 
Because if it's silent, you know, you're going to be in a hard position to be able to say to somebody, you owe me for the investigation cost, which can be 10, 15, 30, 40, whatever thousands of dollars, uh, but quite significant and outside of your, your budget allocation that you had for the year. So having those clauses in a contract clearly stipulated and agreed upon are going to be key. And there's a lot of strategy that goes along with it. You know, are you going to be able to have the same leverage vis-a-vis large corporate multinationals versus a startup which is coming up with a real innovative uh, application likely your 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 leverage posture is going to be very different so what can you get realistically what are the ways to work around it that's an area where we're seeing a lot of activities amongst organizations that are dealing with various types of vendors um, I'm going to skip cyber incident plan, which is, is pretty obvious, uh, basically having a, a roadmap or a plan in terms of a breach occurring. How do you actually respond and how do you actually take next steps? Who do you call? You know, my recommendation, it may seem a bit self-serving, is number one, you call the breach coach or basically a lawyer. And the reason for that is you don't know what you don't know. The breach may be very minor or maybe quite significant. Um, at that point, you want to be able to assert privilege on some of the steps you're going to be taking. Uh, within reason, you know, privilege is not absolute and there's specific requirements around when you can assert it. Uh, but essentially, you want to be able to have that in place if you need it and then run the investigation through the breach coach. But the one I do want to spend maybe half a second on is cyber insurance. Most organizations nowadays will have general liability or GL insurance or maybe some other types of insurance coverage, DNO and, and, and what have you. I, I would, I'm a huge advocate of having cyber insurance specifically. And the reason for that is uh, it covers three main buckets of costs. One is the, the breach coach cost, which I just talked about, which can be important. The second is the technical investigation or forensics, if you wish, which is the bigger piece of any cyber breach response. That's a, I'd say it's maybe 70 or 80% of the cost. Um, and then lastly, to the extent that it becomes public or it's problematic from a PR standpoint, being able to rely and get access to uh, public relation experts who can help you with your brand management and managing a major breach, which is public. Those costs are typically covered under the insurance, uh, once it's under the cyber insurance piece. Last slide, and, and I think we'll open it up to questions afterwards. And again, I don't uh, propose to go through all of them here, uh, but I will focus on a couple of them. Uh, I mentioned the cyber incident plan. This is where once the breach has occurred, you want to activate that plan and the team that's going to be implementing it. So these are your breach coach, for example. You want to make sure you have them lined up beforehand. Uh, you're not scrambling to find who is going to be doing this. And you want somebody who has expertise in, in cybersecurity law or, or breach coaching in particular who can actually uh, be the person who is running quarterback on this. Uh, he or she will then be able to retain a forensic firm. Hopefully you have lined that up as well and the PR firm also, hopefully you have lined that up. But basically activating the team and making sure that the first 72 hours run as smoothly as possible. The next piece is uh, containment and preservation of evidence. Those are the next two items here. You want to, the number one goal of a breach when you're responding to it is to make sure it doesn't spread across the network. If it already has and it's network wide, then you have to figure that piece out and it'll be a different strategy. But to the extent, you know, maybe it's limited to a couple of computers, maybe it's a couple of email accounts that have been compromised, you want to fence that off very, very quickly. You don't want to close it or, or delete it. You want to fence it off. And then you want to monitor and make an assessment of what's going on and what may have occurred. And the reason for that is you also want to preserve evidence. Sometimes clients go back to backups uh, automatically, and that's not always the right solution in every single circumstance. So there's a whole logic and in a sequence in which you want to contain the breach, preserve the evidence, and then move on in terms of next steps for remediation and so on. And the last two pieces are notification. That's part of the, the piece that I talked about a bit more in detail earlier in terms of legal requirements. And lastly, communication. This is where, you know, for whatever unfortunate reasons, the, the breach or the cyber incident becomes public. And at that point, you need to manage the reputation of the organization. So I see we're, we're hitting time here. I'm going to stop uh, and open it up to Q&As. And maybe, Ben, if you, if you have any questions, happy to take them uh, if you've received any through the chat box. We've received many questions because this has been a really helpful uh, and informative webinar. I'm going to move swiftly. I'm sort of grouping them as I go. Um, one major question is around, you know, nonprofits are, uh, many are small. Pretty much all of them are resource strapped. Many rely on um, third-party 
either consultants or software as services or uh, cloud-based providers to collect data, to store data. Um, so what, what would you look for in terms of a checklist or a list of questions in a third-party service provider to know, um, is my data going to be secure? It is, you know, am I going to be protected from, uh, from liability and also in, in the best interest of my, the people on whose, uh, whose data I am collecting? That, that's a really good question. It comes up more often than, than we would think. Um, won't be a surprise. It depends. It depends on each organization. But there are a couple of things that come up all the time. Number one, what data are you going to be transferring over to them? So, for example, if somebody's connecting to your network just to monitor traffic, you, they're probably not accessing personal information. And they don't need access to your entire network necessarily. So, you know, having a good understanding of what data you're going to be transferring over to the extent that that's ever happening is going to be key. The other piece you want to make sure is, and you want to ask the question, do you guys, our vendor, have a security white paper? Can you walk me through the security that you have around the data we give you? Do you encrypt it? Do you tokenize it? Do you put it in the cloud? Do you keep it in Canada? There's a variety of questions we've developed through our own diligence list that should be asked. In terms of liability, uh, more often than not, these third-party providers will have what we call a cap liability. What that is, essentially, they'll say, you know, for the value of the contract or the last three months that you paid, that's going to be the maximum you can ever get from us uh, subject to, you know, gross negligence or, or anything of that nature. And, you know, if you look at the value of some of these contracts, there may be a couple thousand dollars, maybe 10, 15. That clearly is insufficient uh, when it comes to a major breach that may affect the business. So there are issues that you want to look at and, and ask them, you know, how much insurance do you you have you know how much is your cyber insurance and see there's a there's a willingness to negotiate and it goes back to my earlier point about leverage you know how much leverage do you have vis-a-vis -vis that vendor um, if you're a small organization dealing with a large multinational conglomerate chances are your leverage is a bit more limited uh, but if you've got a new company popping up on the market they're Canadian they're hungry they want to do something they want to close the deal they may be a bit more willing to negotiate some of the terms of those agreements Hope that helps. No, absolutely. I think uh, you spoke to a lot of people's concerns there. Um, there are many more questions, but uh, unfortunately, we are out of time for today. So, Imran, is there a good place for people to reach out to you with questions? Absolutely. Um, if you um, if you want to send me an email, uh, I'm on Miller Thompson's website. You can just Google Imran Ahmad Miller Thompson, and you'll find my contact details, telephone, and, and email address. I, I will. I'll, I'll, I'll end on a bit of a, of a slight joke. Um, if you simply Google Imran Ahmad, it's like the John Smith of India. It's the most common name you can find. <laughs> you will find a ton of people. So please make sure to put in either lawyer or Miller Thompson, and you'll you'll hopefully land on me. <laughs> <laughs> that, and I believe so. Also, if people want to um, re, to add um, to have you email them, um, go ahead and fill out the post webinar survey that will pop up on your screen as soon as we're done and we will collect your emails and, and provide them to Imran and he can get in touch with you mm -hmm. afterwards. Um, Imran, if there's nothing else, we are at time, so we're going to wrap it for today. But thank you again, uh, Imran, for a, a really informative and wonderful presentation. And thank you all of uh, our participants for taking time from your busy day to learn more about cybersecurity, data breaches, and uh, how they affect the nonprofit sector. Um, again, please do fill out that post-webinar survey. And uh, we just want to thank everyone again. and Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.